Today, many items have been discussed. Alternative systems, fake news, ecological feminism, decolonization, etc., etc., etc. Statements and recommendations were made. We were inspired, we were touched, and our critical minds were put to work. An important question we should ask ourselves right now is, what conclusions should we draw from this, and how should we proceed in the future? In this final debate, we will reflect on this question, moderated by Jago Kosolowski. Thank you, Izoe. Um, I'd like to start also by saying thanks. And, and first of all, let me start by thanking all of you. In case you didn't know it, it's quite a sunny Friday afternoon outside. It's very hopeful, very inspiring to see all of you here sticking around. We'll finish up around 5 o'clock and we'll try to stay timely, but thank you all. I also want to thank uh, the organizing organizations, of course. We've got Alval Valve together with Vlid US and the NGO Federation who organized this two-day event. It's the second time that Forward Fest has been organized and it is so wonderful to see these organizations invest in these sometimes difficult but necessary conversations about the future of, for lack of a better word, our industry. Um, let me also thank the people that are here on stage with me and who you're here to listen to. And I'll start by, uh, by saying thank you, Jan van der Poel, who has joined us. He'll um, apologize later, but uh, the minister, unfortunately, could not join us uh, last minute. Um, Jan van der Poel is working at the cabinet for the minister of Belgian Development Cooperation, Mariam Kitir, and before he was working at Eurodot, uh, organization bringing together European uh, NGOs. Uh, next to him, him is sitting uh, Jean Bossot, who's the chairman of the NGO Federation. Uh, he's also senior executive at ECDPM, and I gotta read this, gotta excuse me for that, it's the European Center for Develop Development Policy Management. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Almo I almost managed to do it. Next to Jean is sitting Els Hertogen. She's director of Alval Valve, which is, as we know, um, the coalition of organizations within our industry. And she has over a decade experience with Alval Valve within the organization. Next to Els is uh, sitting Dr. Anne uh, Peters. She is a member of the board of Vlir UOS, and she is also a professor at VUB, the Free University of Brussels, in Italian and general literature. Now, for all of you here, um, today will not be a debate. We're seeing this as a closing conversation, and we really want to try to take the lessons that we learned over the past few days, the conversations that were had, and kind of bring it back to the people behind uh, this event, the people organizing this, bringing everyone together, and of course, also the policymakers. Um, there will be three topics that we will give attention, and each topic will be introduced by someone who did the session, who partook in this conference, to translate what was done there to this final um, closing uh, conversation. So we're going to start with Anna Pashauser. She is a UN Youth Delegate uh, for Sustainable Development as part of the Flemish Youth Council. And every person who will be introducing one of the three subjects will also be launching one question towards our panel. So I want to invite Anna Pashauser up to the speaker's podium. And give her a round of applause, yeah. She deserves one. Thank you. Is this working? Okay, great. Dear everyone, today I have the honor to present to you a statement of the youth. How do you, we, young people, look at the future of international solidarity? Do we still have hope, or are you here for no reason? I am not making this statement on my own, but together with almost 100 young people who made their voices heard in an online survey. Some who are active in the world of international solidarity, others for whom this is still a new concept. Many young people still encounter many barriers to get involved and participate in international solidarity. They don't feel heard, although they represent very important voices. Even today, during the youth session, we saw these barriers confirmed. Many young voices were not represented, and uh, it made us question um, whether the international solidarity sector really reaches the full diversity of youth. Young people notice that even when they raise their voices, they are not nearly enough um, involved in policy-making processes. We hope that this message will reach Minister Kitir, who we unfortunately could not address in person today. The survey and our conversations show that we, young people, demand structural um, and sustainable changes instead of only crisis support. 
we have to continue focusing on addressing the roots of structural problems when talking about issues such as colonization, climate change, human rights, and war and conflict. We expect international solidarity to be based upon equity and equality, while addressing structural inequalities and privileges within the system. We believe in fairness and justice from a human perspective. It is urgent and we cannot wait. Society and policymakers need to address international solidarity issues right now. As you heard, we are very passionate about an array of issues um, linked to international solidarity, but the question becomes how and where do we put our passion into practice? The sector claims it wants us to be involved, but we wonder where is the platform or entry point? Where are the opportunities that respond to our reality? If you want to involve us, you really have to get to know us. We are an extremely diverse group of young people with different profiles, different privileges, and different drives. Making volunteering, engagement, and working in the sector accessible for everyone is very essential. This can be done, for example, by using the right channels to reach us, creating student jobs, valuing passion and motivation, providing volunteer fees, and organizing low barrier events. Listen to us. We ask you to take action to radically change our unequal system. Dare to take stand, take risks, stand firm, and act now. Thank you. Now I have actually two questions for the panel. <laughs> um, so the first one is, according to the survey, young people see the international solidarity sector as passive, conservative, and not diverse. They feel like they don't have an impact and don't feel heard. So my question to you is, what do you think of this statement and where do you think this is coming from? So that's the first one. The second question is the following. Um, how do the panel members think they can increase the role and involvement of young people in the sector of international solidarity from the perspective of their organization? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And please give her another round of applause. I think we all on the stage realize that this is a very pertinent, very important question. Um, I'd like to uh, kick off with you, Els, um, to see how you want to respond to this question. So the question was, the initial question, the sector is seen as passive, conservative, and not diverse. How is this being dealt with? Well, I, I think the first question also was what do you think about the statement, and I, 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 uh, I relate to the statement because um, it has been put forward uh, numerous times uh, for several years now, and especially the, the aspect of not being diverse. I think when you look into this room, you see there's no diversity. Um, maybe a little more in, in age, but not on, on background, uh, etc. Are we passive? Are we conservative? I don't know if we're passive as a sector. Um, I think we have been quite active uh, for the past decades, but um, from a very homogeneous uh, perspective, so not in a diverse way. Are we conservative? Mm, yes, I think we're still quite conservative, conservative, although I think looking at the debates we are having during this Forward Fest, we are really tr trying to change and at least um, opening up uh, certain debates and certain ways of, of, of approaching um, international solidarity. So I relate to this, but still I see a lot of opportunities. So um, um, going to the second uh, question on, okay, what can Triple Eleven do? I see a lot of opportunities because when I hear the statement, um, it confirms that um, young people need to be listened to. Um, they have a lot of um, drive, they have a lot of ideas, they have a lot of claims to put forward, and as has been said, politicians are not listening at this moment. So the question for our sector is not how can we um, convince young people to come to our activities that are being set up by Triple Eleven, for example, but the question should be how can we make their claims more visible? How can we, as has been asked, um, get more acquainted with what drives young people People, what are actually the issues they are working on, and how can we provide windows or frameworks um, of how they can engage, but then let them um, fill in all the details um, uh, to, to make their engagement more concrete. So for Triple Eleven, we are really uh, aware of the fact that there are still, uh, or 
there are already a lot of young people that look into the world and see injustice. They do not want to engage from a charity perspective, but they really want to tackle the injustice. So it's the same agenda as we have, but we acknowledge that the way that we um, engage people is not the way they want to be engaged. And so what we try to do, and I will give two examples, is we try to put forward windows of engagement. For example, we uh, offered the opportunity to a lot of young people to go to the conference in Glasgow. So we made it possible for them to go, but we made them um, uh, decide how they prepared, what they wanted to do during the, uh, the conference in Glasgow, and also how they wanted to reach out to other people when they came back. And a second uh, thing we developed is a social platform, which is called Lovers Are the Best Fighters. So we um, finance this platform, but it's up to young people to decide on the content um, of what is being put forward and the way they want to discuss with young people. Um, we still have a lot of things uh, to learn um, because it means a power shift. It means that we give space to young people to help define our agenda, to um, um, yeah, define for, the, for themselves how they want to put forward their claims. And, and yeah, it entails a lot of risk because they do it in different ways than we professionals should do. But I definitely believe that this is the way to go. Um, so I have heard the statement and I just want to confirm that I've heard you and uh, we just want to, together with young people, uh, keep on developing uh, different ways of um, going public with the claims. Very interesting response because you touch on the core of this transfer of power and, and it feels as taking a risk and we at Mo are also doing the same exercise and we're going to invest heavily in this over the next coming years but it's really about that trust and being willing to, to give power over to, to someone else. Uh, I'd like to pass uh, the microphone now or at least give the word to uh, Jan van der Poel who is here um, representing uh, Minister Kittir. Thank you, Iago. And... Um, Maybe first of all, just want to apologize um, uh, and for the minister. She couldn't attend today. Um, she's leaving for Palestine over the weekend, so there were some pressing, urgent uh, issues. So I realize I'm the disappointment uh, of the day. Um, it's a bit the story of my life, but, but um, um, just again, um, she asked me explicitly to, to, um, to thank you for the invitation uh, for this wonderful event and this wonderful organization. And maybe to, to Anna, who, who read the statement of the youth, uh, I am listening and I will make sure uh, to deliver the statement um, if I get it in writing. Or, or maybe we can set up a meeting at the cabinet. Maybe that's even better to make sure that this conversation happens. Because I think um, a lot was touched upon that, as El said, we, we uh, uh, in the cabinet, um, we, we can relate to uh, as well. Um, maybe first of all, you said, do we still have hope, was the first thing I, I wrote down in the statement, and I think that's, um, I hope so, and, and uh, I, I think we should have hope. Um, I think um, there's a lot of reason for, for optimism um, uh, as well, and, and I think I heard you say two things. Eh? Get to know us was the first takeaway, uh, and I think what else uh, is mentioning and, and what Mo is doing, I think that's key eh, to make sure that uh, those messages get across because a lot is changing. Those messages are different, are challenging, are more radical, are about structural change. And I think we really need to, to capture that. And second is, um, I think the second uh, takeaway for me in, in your uh, statement was uh, make sure our voice gets heard, gets across. Um, and that's also something that, um, that we are doing, that the minister is doing, using that platform as, as Minister of Development Cooperation. For instance, in the, in the COP, it was mentioned in the climate conference, using that, that platform, the stage, um, to join uh, uh, young people um, to use that voice as well, eh? to, to use the occasion. So that's something that we are looking at, at doing as well. Going to the next, it will be the, the African COP. Can we... Um, not only Belgian uh, uh, youths, uh, of course, but also from partner countries, how can we bring them to this key um, room where decisions are made that affect them uh, directly. Um, no, I'll keep it at that. So I'll make sure to deliver the statement, and again, um, let's, let's have this conversation um, in the coming weeks. 
So uh, yeah, I'll note that what is being happen, what, what will happen from the cabinet is uh, this meeting that will be set up. So by now, it's a, it's a fact. I heard an invitation. So uh, let's make sure that happens. Um, I'd like to give the word now um, to uh, Dr. Peters, and uh, and also same question again. Do you agree with the statement that was made? Um, what do you see around you? And also, what is your organization doing um, to tackle this? Okay, um, first of all, I would like to thank Anna uh, for the very interesting, but also at the same time a bit challenging question. I thought, when I heard the question, I thought we could easily fill an hour only debating on, on this issue, but I do agree uh, that young people feel somehow left out in the process. However, I also think this is a process that perhaps requires time. Um, I think if you, if you look at it from a more academic point of view, so it's a quite interesting but also complex process. So over the past few decades, we have seen uh, an increasing degree of globalization worldwide, which brought lots of challenges on top of all the other um, global challenges that, uh, that we are facing. Now, so usually first research is conducted on uh, those challenges, then afterwards the findings of the research processes are also imp implemented in the teaching processes in university, but also other uh, higher education institutes, uh, other organizations, etc. So it is by such a bit of a slow process, but I think it is crucial. I'm not going to um, explain how, because that might be the answer to the second question, but I do agree it's crucial to involve also youth, uh, but at the same time we have to realize that we can't, we can't rush because th those are very important matters indeed. And um, I would like to refer to a song of uh, Sam Cooke, who sang approximately 50 years ago, I think it was in 1968, a change is going to come, so I really hope and would like to promise to, to the younger generation a change is uh, on its way, it's already happening, but perhaps we should, we should wait a couple of months, hopefully in the worst case scenario years, to see these changes also really uh, happening. Thank you. Of course, the young people from the 60s uh, have become quite old by now, so this is uh, something I'm sure Anna has an has a interesting response to. Um, I'll move to Jean Bossert, and well, by now, you know the, the same questions. Yeah, as a kid of the 60s. <laughs> no, uh, maybe also for the people who are not uh, here in the room and don't know the difference between 11.11 and NGO Federation. Uh, I'm from the NGO Federation, and we complement the political work of 11.11, so I will not repeat what Els is saying. We try to uh, defend the interest of the NGO sector in, uh, in public policy making, but also to improve the quality of the work, and that's where this issue comes in. When I then go to the statement, passive, conservative, and uh, not diverse, passive I would agree, that's I think what we are not. Because just like the youth, we realize that it's no time to waste. There are urgent structural challenges, uh, justice. In 2015, we updated all our vision on what is the role of NGOs, or NGOs also in the world. The text is there, and it was unanimously accepted by the whole federation, by the way, also by 11.11. And that's very con consistent with the agenda here. Of course, the, some words were not there. Decolonization was not there, and youth was not there as explicitly. So I would also say that we are not conservative, because after this vision, we had at least then Toekomstwerden, I don't know how you say this in English, chantier du futur, building sites of the future, which are concrete ways to bring our members together to say, let's try to find ways to change. Microphone. Let's try to find ways to change. And diversity and inclusion was one of them. Youth, not. And so I come to the third element. Yes, we are not diverse enough. I think uh, everyone will recognize is that we have there a backlog. Though there are a lot of initiatives taken by members, uh, like you do it also, to involve them. But that's the second Make question. Make sure you keep the microphone uh, yes, in your mouth. Yes, that's the second question. Good that's not easy for me audience. to keep the microphone close to me. <laughs> so, um, uh, the second statement, uh, what can we do about it? Maybe very quickly, I think that in the NGO Federation, we will have to do an effort to fully integrate youth in all the other issues that are on our agenda. It is there, but not visibly enough, not clearly enough. So I think we will certainly try to do an exercise to see what is happening already. 
among our members. And I'm sure we will find a lot of things. So that's an internal work. Secondly, very important, if we open up to the youth, we must absolutely avoid to have tokenistic exercises. I also work in a think tank. I see in Africa, everywhere in the world, young people being uh, cajoled to conferences. But it's just to show that the young people have been there. They have no power whatsoever. They have no real voice. C'est un peu du cinéma, like they say in French. And this danger is real, because then I think our youth, young people will not only be frustrated, but will not contribute, and we need their voices. And then a, a last point, and it's a bit like Anna, I think if we then open the door and we really also look at how we can give power, shift the power eh, to young people, then we have to find ways to dialogue. Because as you say, we have to have an intergenerational dialogue. I don't say this for me, I say this because I also look at many places where this dialogue is difficult between younger and older generations, and we have to co-create also there. You also see it in Africa, where young people often cannot have voice because they are also trapped in all kinds of systems of norms and hierarchies. They feel even more disempowered than here, so we must take into account this need to build bridges with the other generations. I think otherwise we will have problems, or not advance quickly enough. Thank you so much. We're going to have to close this topic, unfortunately, because we have limited time. We want to get everyone home on time. But for the young people in the audience, I heard a lot of bold statements. I heard a lot of semi-promises. Follow up on those. And feel free to quote the people who have said them. I'm going to invite uh, the second speaker uh, to, the, to the stage. The next topic that we're going to tackle is um, the financing of equal partnerships. There were a few sessions on this topic as well, so I'd like to invite um, the next speaker to the stage. I thought they were going to start with a small film, if I had it right, no? that is led by the partners themselves. And the what? Yeah. <clears throat> so maybe some, uh, some more info on how to... Dear members uh, of the panel, dear colleagues, uh, dear everyone in the audience, I'm Jan Wiegaert, uh, working for, from, uh, for Ricolto, and today I participated in a highly relevant and inspiring workshop, uh, a hackathon, uh, for those who know the concept. Uh, this workshop focused on one important question. What kind of financing mechanism do we need uh, to build equal uh, global partnerships? And I have the honor and the pleasure on behalf of the people who participated in the workshop to give you a brief summary of the insights and conclusions. Quite a challenge. 
uh, the output of the dialogues was very diverse and very rich. Why are equal partnerships so important? The division between North and South uh, becomes less relevant when we look at the world today. Climate, inequality, livable cities, decent work are challenges that are everywhere. In Indonesia, Ecuador, Senegal and Belgium. And the right to health and social protection, a healthy environment, food and education are global agendas all over the world. Again, in Ecuador, Indonesia, Senegal and in Belgium. We find people and organizations tackling these challenges in their context. This is their contribution to this global agenda. And we can no longer assume that knowledge and expertise are exported from north to south and implemented in the south through projects and programs. And this is a way of looking at things which, which uh, consolidates colonial relationships and perceptions. Knowledge and practices are built up all over the world. Uh, how can we exchange, strengthen, and broaden that knowledge and practices through flexible but strong networks. How can we become stronger and smarter together? Many of us are experimenting with different approaches. The question is how we can adapt the existing financing mechanisms to these evolutions. Dear panel members, I'm Curious to hear your views on the following insights, or the following thoughts. Nice that the DGD program framework provides quite some flexibility and stability in the longer run. At the other hand, eh, we see quite some challenges. Money is interlinked with power, and the one who has the power sets the agenda. Actors follow this agenda in the proposals they write, and control is based on indicators linked to the same agenda. So the donor system is still functioning, maybe, within a north-south paradigm, while we face, again, at global challenges. At the same time, we see that worldwide people and their organizations are working in their context on the same objectives, eh, building on new practices and delivering new insights and knowledge. They organize themselves in networks, and some elements of the identity of those networks are eh, network partners share a common vision and goals. They share resources and decision power. Members have democratic access to funding Partners can use the funds for their needs in their specific context. Building trust eh, among network partners and between funders and the network is a precondition. Just one question or suggestion out of many. Can we introduce in the future co-designed programs of networks composed by Belgian and international partners? Charles Kojo van Dijk, who is working for the West Africa Civil Society Institute, pinpointed the challenge. Can we reimagine financial frameworks and donor relations beyond cost contribution? Can we also look at non-financial contributions, how to valorize and quantify expertise, knowledge, services? How can we make the shift? Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Let's give uh, Jan Rikard from Recolta a round of applause. I'd like to ask uh, the speakers to keep it quite brief because the final topic is the last one I want to cut short. So do please elaborate where necessary, but uh, don't take up too much time. Uh, I'd like to start this question uh, addressed to Jean Bosset. Yeah. I think this is a very good presentation. And uh, the diagnosis of both our federation, I could say, and certainly of our think tank and many other think tanks, uh, is that our aid system has to radically change because it's precisely 
no longer adapted to the global challenges. It is a thing of 50 years ago. It had a different logic, north-south transfers, all kinds of other assumptions, they are no longer there. But the bureaucratic system and even the aid industry attached to it is still there. There have been openings, there have been openings. NGOs are trying also there to innovate, but we face walls, we face all kinds of walls. And we all agree that we have to be more flexible, more process-oriented, de de decentralized, have indeed co-design programs and all the rest of it, go to smaller organizations, go to young people, go to all these other actors who are not formally organized, etc., who are often the real drivers of change. We all know this, but the system has not evolved. And in 30 years, that also our institute had said, we have to radically change. I see it in the European Union. There are cosmetic marginal changes. They try, they try. But how can you change this? I would say, let's at least in our sector try to innovate, try to push the boundaries. We can have a little bit of control on how we set together the agenda. We can do a lot of things as NGO movement, but we also get our funds from the donor industry, and I think there we have to open the dialogue. We have tried it, eh? Else also many others have tried in other European countries, but I'm afraid to even say the managerial approach is winning terrain rather than going back. Belgium is relatively okay there, but other countries are even going further in that bureaucratic logic, contrary to the global challenges we face now. So I look, this is really a question for policymakers, I think. This is an easy one for me to pass on to Jan van der Poel, of course, when we, when we talk about the, the system and policymakers, uh, this, this would be... Uh, and it's not new, eh? It's not a new issue. You, you have the easiest job of the afternoon, uh, <laughs> Iago, in, in fact. No, it looked like a very fun session, actually, uh, watching <laughs> the video clip that was shown. Um, no, um, maybe it's surprising, maybe not, but from, my, from our perspective in, in, in the minister's cabinet, I, I haven't heard anything I would disagree with. Um, uh, now, maybe taking one step back, I think the context is clear. Eh? I think this is um, probably known to most of the people in, in this room that indeed for too long development cooperation was one-way traffic and was, was uh, about rich developed countries. Um, going overseas to help poor countries and telling them what, what's in their best interest. I think and it's, uh, it's, it's good that that's changing. Low-income countries know what's in their best interest and are being very vocal about this. And Jean, uh, he follows the EU-Africa discussions for a long time, so he knows this very, very well. So that context is clear. Um, I think um, from the policy perspective, um, it's clear we need to, and we are asking ourselves this question as well. Eh? We have a quite, I think, a very unique model in our development cooperation. We firmly believe we are committed to civil society. We think civil society is a key actor of change, a driver of change, and this, this reflects in this long-term stable funding that's not focusing on what civil society should do, but on... Um, capacities, expertise, and, and it's civil society that's, that's um, um, uh, formulating or, 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 or defining uh, what to do. And I think that's, that's something to be proud of as well um, in, an, in an EU international context. But I do share these this, this questions on um, why is a financial relation to, to the northern NGO that then on why, why, I mean, I think these are very valid questions, and you will find in us, in, 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 in the cabinet, um, um, an ally for this, uh, but also, Jean mentioned dialogue. Um, we're looking forward to this, to this dialogue to see how we can reduce the barriers um, um, and, and provide incentives. Um, um, will this be a radical shift? I don't know, but I think we are very open to that dialogue to, 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 um, um, to strengthen uh, the role of uh, southern partners, southern people in the driving seat in development cooperation. So yes, um, we should allow experimenting. Let's have the dialogue. Let's discuss and see how we, how we uh, can move into that, in, in that direction. So again, not a firm commitment, Tiago, but... Uh, an I openness for dialogue for sure, so don't quote on. me on the <laughs> invitation for dialogue. Effectively, that's already a lot. And it's very topical as well that Jan Ricard from Ricolto was introducing this topic because it's one of the organizations that has really, at an organizational level, handed over a lot of this power and, and I think a lot of us are looking at their model with interest as well. Uh, else. 
Yes, um, thank you for your presentation, Jan, and for the response already. Um, for me, this is an example that we have not been so passive as, an, as, an, uh, as NGOs, because um, the reason why we are having this discussion is because Recolto, but also other organizations have been experimenting, and at this moment we have certain um, already questions to put forward towards the cabinet, and I think uh, this is an appeal to, to everyone in this room to keep on just keep on experimenting and taking the place we still have at this moment uh, in Belgium uh, when, when looking at where we are funded. Um, and I have certain uh, interesting points. For example, from Triple Eleven, we have expertise on uh, budget uh, funding. And I think we were like one of the, yeah, we're, we're quite in the lead on this, like giving budget funding to, to uh, partner organizations, discussing with them what they want to change and not uh, linking our funding to certain activities or projects, etc. So we want to discuss with you on this and, and how uh, the DGD framework can be changed on this point. But on the other side, we also, uh, we cannot only look at the cabinet, we also have work to do as NGOs. And for example, we can do power analysis with our partners. At this moment, we can discuss with them within the framework that we have, how can we change power imbalances? How can we shift control on funding? Um, we can discuss on how to change our organizational logic because we have been working for decades now. Um, although our minds are shifting, uh, certain organizational logics are just quite hard to change and we have to uh, keep on um, challenging ourselves to, to look where we can improve uh, already and it can change by changing our language, by uh, looking at um, who are we discussing uh, who are we discussing strategies and and and, and managing funds, etc. So we're looking at the cabinet, but we also have to look at ourselves to keep on experimenting and pushing the discussion further. Thank you, uh, Dr. Peters. The academic world isn't necessarily known to be very forward striving. I'm, I'm very interested to hear your experiences and your view on this topic. The wire was stuck. Um, yes, first of all, thank you very much for this question. It's an it's yet another very challenging uh, topic. Uh, I think I agree mostly that uh, also in this case we need to implement changes. Uh, way too often in the past, um, collaboration with the Global South has been considered um, in the following dynamics. So for instance, there is a challenge or a problem um, where we're willing to fund, uh, but also where we keep everything under control and Unfortunately, often we also say this is the way uh, this challenge or problem needs to be solved. Uh, fortunately, however, uh, in the recent in recent times, uh, there has been a bit of a paradigm shift. Uh, so, concerning Vlir UOS, uh, most of the projects, or almost all our projects with the Global South, uh, are funded by by Vlir UOS. But the involvement of um, the local partner is crucial. So. More often than not, it starts with a dream that two or a group of academics have, uh, both here in Belgium and uh, in a country of the Global South. But then very clear objectives needs, need to be determined, but also um, the local partner is basically in charge of pointing out or putting the focus on the priorities that are needed on the plan of action, on a plan for financing, and the proposal could nowadays would never be approved without this explicit um, involvement. Also, the ownership of the project by the local institutions, uh, let it be universities, institutes in higher education or NGOs, is crucial because um, Vlir UOS considers them, in fact, the actors of change. Uh, not only for the university or the project involved, but also in order to realize um, a more a broader change, a societal change, uh, because more often than not, uh, scientific projects don't even ha don't only have an impact on universities, but the results are might be very very useful also to see how um, changes in society in general can be implemented. So that's one of the key. Um, actions of Vlir OS, but of course it it's, might as well be possible that this is still not enough, and that in the future also um, the governance model needs to be needs to be uh, examined, and where necessary further changes need to be uh, implemented. 
Thank you, Dr. Peters. Um, we're moving on to the final uh, topic, which, if anything, is the, the most interesting and definitely urgent, decolonization and international uh, solidarity. Um, be, we'll see a short little video, and afterwards, uh, Tama Dahan, working for Triple Eleven, will give her personal reflection on the sessions that were uh, held around this topic, and she will give the final questions to our panel. If there is no video, Tama can come to the stage. <laughs> I would also like to apologize for the <laughs> hectic organization. It's been quite challenging to bring the information from these sessions that yeah. took place yesterday and today to the stage. Um, we're trying our best. Thank you all for hanging in there. Tama, please. Thank you, Yako. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, um, panel members. Um, it's not more than a couple of months that I'm part of the NGO, the so-called NGO sector the sector of uh, international solidarity. And I must say that, uh, especially after this um, marvelous festival of two days, I'm still pleasantly surprised that um, within this sector there is so much space for growth and to be conscious and self-critical about our colonial past and the way that we try to deal with it. And the most important insights that I have is that uh, the workshops still learned us that dialoguing on decolonization and international solidarity is key and it's absolutely irreversible. So there is no way back and it's there to stay. And so I'm glad to see that we can encourage each other and that we can learn from each other and develop together the right tools instruments to make that big shift, because it's needed. But the most important challenge, of course, is first to look in the mirror, to look at ourselves, and making our own homework. And we need to go full force on equal partnerships and a more ethical use of language and images in our overall communication. So, and here is my first question. In which way would you like to contribute to the decolonization of our sector, to the decolonization of yeah, the NGO sector? The second one is um, the reflection that we made that decolonization, of course, means redistribution of power. And I think that COVID learned us that there is still a large gap in access to healthcare. Vaccine inequality has been dominating the debates since months. Um, and there has been a lot of pressure, also by us, by the NGO sector, on the pharma industry to share their knowledge, to share their power, and to share resources internationally. There's been that successful case in South Africa um, and my question is, does this case and the fact that we can put pressure on industries to make a shift, is that kind of approach also applicable towards other industries? Could we use this case and inspire others to rethink global issues? So the main question is, how can we move forward? Uh, in the decolonization of other global issues, such as, for instance, climate change and climate justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tama. Please give her a round of applause. <laughs> Very interesting question. Vaccine inequality, the fact that the patents have not been lifted yet. There have been conscious efforts to share knowledge. Has it been enough? There's different opinions on this. I want to start with you, um, Jan. Do you think th this model, and also how successful it has been, or how unsuccessful it has been, can be something that can be yep. replicated on uh, other topics? Uh, thank you, thank you, Iago. It's um, you announced it as I think the most interesting and maybe the most difficult um, topic. 
Um, I would agree with Tama what she said, um, uh, maybe uncomfortable, but dare to stay, this discussion on, on decolonization. And you mentioned it's about equal partnerships, it's about communication, and just one example, um, one of the minister's first decisions was to change the, the policy note for the next, well, it was four years at the time, um, uh, not development cooperation, but international solidarity, and, and Triple Eleven also changed its name. And that's words, that's, um, John mentioned tokenism, um, there's a risk for that, but it, it's, it's, more than, it's more than that. And it is about equal partnership. And uh, I think the vaccine um, discussion and debate is a very, very good uh, example. Uh, when, when COVID hit, there was, uh, let's be honest, uh, there was uh, a run on available vaccines. Uh, the debate on the, the TRIPS waiver and uh, the discussion on the, the pet it was going nowhere. So at that time, I think sharing excess vaccines was necessity. I mean, at the time, that was that was uh, something that could be done immediately. And then that shifted. And I think Belgium and, and Minister Kitir played a key role in that, eh? in, in making local production uh, happen, making Africa independent from pharmaceutical companies. I th the story is mentioned. I'm, I'm happy that it's mentioned. I think it's a great uh, example of shifting power uh, relations eh? with a very small investment, uh, African scientists with African expertise build an African vaccine. And it's not just about the COVID vaccine. It's about other diseases, other um, uh, issues as well. Um, is this a model? I think so. I think indeed this is something we, um, we should aim for, look at uh, climate change, um, uh, where uh, infrastructure, um, energy infrastructure, um, uh, building that, uh, I think this is, 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 a, is a lesson uh, we can learn. I think there's a lot to be done and it's not mainstream, um, but I think their development cooperation can play um, uh, a, key, a key role. So for me, uh, or for us, um, decolonization um, is about exactly that, I think. It's a debate about the colonial past, but it's about shifting um, that, re that power relations and that um, um, designing our policies to do exactly that. And, and, yeah. A useful model, but also one to improve upon. Uh, perhaps. Um, I'd like to give the word to um, uh, Dr. Uh, Peters. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, especially for, yes, that's the second time my wire got stuck, I know. Um, for the interesting question, and actually I couldn't agree more with, with what already has been, has been mentioned. So, uh, indeed, decolonialization um, is, I think, crucially important. Um, not only on the level of um, countries, governments, um, NGOs, the, the United Nations, but I, I believe uh, that this process starts in education itself. So I think um, bringing, back, bringing together young people, let it be here or in, uh, in a different country, is a key aspect for the development of, of and the finding of solutions. So for instance, when students uh, can work on a topic, bring in their own perspective from different countries, different backgrounds, uh, I think this is the way to, to move forward. Um, I also believe communication is a key aspect uh, in this process and perhaps we should try in, in general to empower uh, young people with three different uh, but essential skills. So I think first of all, um, to be critical, uh, not to consider facts as facts. It's, it's a very um, relevant topic nowadays also, unfortunately, uh, with the war in, in Ukraine. I think uh, students and young people in general need to know how to look at facts and not to believe everything what, what is being and has been uh, said. I also think Young people nowadays should learn to be resilient, not to give up, uh, and especially to finally to develop some kind of what I'd like to call global thrust. Trust in each other, uh, trust in young people from um, other countries in order to find, discuss, and uh, execute solutions together, because I don't think the solution will, will lay in the north or in the south, but it can only be realized through mutual understanding and collaboration, especially in, in young people. 
I'd like to move on to you, uh, Jean, and basically repeat the question also that how is the NGO Federation, yeah. how are you contributing to decolonization? Because I, I do feel decolonization is a word that is uttered a lot more than it is actually acted upon, so I'm very curious to hear. Thank you. Well, uh, decolonization and the NGO Federation is one of our Tukomstwerven, one of our building sites for the future. And we have advanced quite a lot on it. You have seen the brochure we produced uh, together with all kinds of expertise. And now, in fact, two weeks ago, one week ago, uh, we had a meeting uh, with uh, the leading leadership of uh, several NGOs to say, how far have you advanced on this? And two things are extremely important, I think, maybe for your interest also. One that we say, let's use decolonization in a broad sense, a bit like Anne also said. Eh? It is decolonization and dealing with the colonial past, but it's also about many other things that are very connected to it. Power shift, very important. Uh, racism, diversity and inclusion comes back. Interculturality. So uh, we open this definition beyond the, the, the more uh, strict interpretation of decolonization, and I think that's a very positive Stimulus, stimulus for our members to work with it. Because shifting power, many, many examples are busy. I recall to is only one where they try to shift power. And in that meeting, we had presentations of two NGOs who say, well, we are quite far, but, but we face a lot of dilemmas, all kind of operational dilemmas. But it was very exciting, and I think we had a collective learning that is, uh, is asking for more. So I think we are moving. And I'm sure that it's not just a loose promise. I think we tackle it. But each organization does it its own way, uh, with a lot of dialogue, and it requires a lot of sensi sensitivity on all sides. To be honest, I think that the biggest challenge for moving on decolonization will be dialogue in mutual respect. Uh, we have to listen to each other, but also listen to the different perspectives. And that is challenging, including in the organizations of our members, who, for instance, said in many partner countries in Africa, our partners said, decolonization, what do you mean? So uh, it's not evident to immediately find a consensus. So we are working on this, and maybe can I ask quickly, very quickly answer the two questions of Madame, the presenter. A redistribution of power for us stands at the center. I think that's also what young people want. Justice, climate justice, social justice. But redistribution of power can happen at international level. The pharmaceutical eh, is one example. There are many other examples where global movements are pushing for rights, for norms. Look at the abortion now uh, in uh, America. Look at the global movements that are there, across the globe. But I think we should also look at redistribution of power within the countries of the Global South, within the societies of the Global South. 30 years that I have worked in Africa particularly, and when I see the imbalances of power there, and the devastating effect on development, I think we should integrate also that shift of power, and that's what young people in Africa want. That's what civil society in Africa wants. That has nothing necessarily to do with us. So let's have a very open, debate on all the powers that have to shift in our own society, in development, and NGO sector, in the South, in societies of the South, then I think we will maybe move also in a constructive way and co-create the change needed. Very nice uh, remarks, Jean. Thank you. Thank you for that. And before moving to, to Els on, on this topic, I also can say and relate to you, Els, that we've we at Mo are doing this this exercise and investing in this and over the next coming years, and this takes time, you know, getting uh, people of different origins into your board of directors, getting young people into your board of directors, setting up a youth advisory board, getting the money for all of this. We are investing now. It'll be years before you see the things that you should have seen 20 years ago or when I was born or whenever. Uh, you know, we, we all want these things to have happened yesterday, but I want to pass the question to you, else and also ask uh, alongside the, the broader questions of, of, uh, of Tama, how do you face these tough dilemmas and, and these difficult uh, decisions? Yeah, we'll also get into that. Um, the, the first question of Tama was, um, how can we as Triple Eleven and also put forward the discussion on, on decolonization? I think using the term decolonization is already very important. And I know it's, it's quite polarized also in the sector, but by using the term decolonization at this point, I hope that after two or three years, we do not have to use this term anymore. By using the, the, the D, it means that we explicitly say that we do not agree with colonial period. And it's very important to do this as a sector because we need to recognize explicitly that we have our roots in this colonial period. And um, it's not, we do not have to um, recognize this explicitly to then decide, okay, we have to stop, no, but it has to um, stimulate us to go further in the creating the better world, the more just world that we want to see. So it's very important that Triple Eleven puts forward this word 
and also um, because it means that colonialism that we still see today, we also do not agree with this. So it's also decolonization, not only about uh, history, but also uh, today. So I think that's very important that we uh, keep putting forward this term. But of course, it's, it's about power shift. So if we want to come to a more just, just world, um, for me, decolonization, um, it's, it's, um, it challenges us as Belgian, European NGOs to um, invest more on advocacy towards Belgian and European governments. Because when you look at geopolitical power imbalances, for example, on discussion on climate change, you see that there's more power uh, at European level that, uh, than with the uh, um, lower income countries. So it's up to us to go to our uh, politicians and to state that they have to um, decide on a policy that is uh, more just and they need to um, um, uh, when they um, promise to give climate finance, okay, they have to give this, uh, 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 this, this promised money. If they promise to uh, reduce emissions, okay, they have to reduce. So it's up to us to invest more in advocacy. That's our role in this global partnerships with change makers worldwide. They do their role, advocacy in their countries. We have to do it here in Belgium and in Europe. But it also means to decolonize our own organization. And it means um, doing a power analysis on governance, but also how you decide on a daily basis, not only your board of directors, directors but who is in a working group, etc. Um, it, it's about language, uh, Triple Eleven, for example, we, we now talk about change makers, we talk about international solidarity, no longer north south, but it's quite difficult because we have uh, discussions, um, especially with people that have been engaged for decades now um, in this movement and that have um, been doing a lot of tremendous work, they have not been passive, but changing worlds, uh, words, it connects to their identity. So um, it's quite hard by times, but I think we as Triple Eleven, we, yeah, we, it's uh, irreversible that we open up the discussions. And for us, it's quite new to look for ways to create um, safe spaces to have this dialogue. Uh, I, I attended a session on deep democracy. For me, it was quite new. It says a lot that to me it's quite new, but I, I see it as a, as a very positive thing that we have the discussion and we want to um, look for ways to, to have these debates in a different way that, than we have been doing for the past decades. Um, and the last thing I wanted to point out is that um, it's very important that we take a stand against racism. It has not been mentioned yet, but uh, for me, uh, I think it's very important that as a sector, we acknowledge that uh, socioeconomic exploitation is paralleled by uh, racism and it still keeps going on today. So if we want to tackle socioeconomic injustice, we also have a huge opportunity to tackle uh, racism here and worldwide. And just to end up by the, uh, the question of, Okay, um, what we did um, on, on facts and inequality and putting pressure on industries, yes, it's what we should be doing. And for example, if we know that every minute we spend nine and a half million euros giving subsidies to fossil fuel companies, there is a lot of power to politicians, not only Belgian level, but international level to look at, okay, this is a political decision. Do we keep on subsidizing uh, these kind of companies in such a way? And so for me, this, this is about, about uh, power imbalances. And if you look at um, the power imbalances during the uh, international conference in Glasgow, you looked at ind indigenous people that were being put on the stage, but uh, they had prepared their claims that were not listened to. And then you have the fossil fuel companies that were not on stage, but had huge impact on the outcome. This is, yes, we have to uh, keep uh, pointing out these power imbalances and we have to work on uh, these analysis, but also putting pressure on politicians to, uh, to shift the power. Thank you so much. As kind of a, a closing statement, I would like, like to direct myself to the people in the audience who are perhaps impatient. We share this impatience. Else shares this impatience about her organization, Jean does. We, we, we share this feeling, um, but I would like to say thanks because we cannot forget that this is the second edition of Forward Fest. There are people here from three organizations that put their money where their mouth is. You know, they are literally funding uncomfortable conversations for themselves. Uh, I'm impatient about the moves we have to make at Mo. I'm impatient about seeing a different world arise do not be mistaken, and perhaps I'm saying this more to 16-year-old uh, me, do not be mistaken that your impatience, you're not alone in, in feeling this. That doesn't mean that enough is being done today, 
but it does mean that there are people that you, are, you can collaborate with and listen. So I'd like to thank Alva Valf uh, once again, Triple Alf, the NGO Federation, and also Vler US for putting their money uh, where their mouth is. And thank also the four speakers present here today, including uh, Jan van der Poel. <laughs> so please give an applause. Thank you. I'll now give the final closing word to Izoe. Well, I've uh, heard a lot of thank yous today, and uh, believe it or not, but I'm going to add a few extra thank yous. Uh, I think you can't say thank you enough. Um, well, um, I would like to thank everyone who contributed to this uh, event today, not only today, but of course also yesterday on the first day of Forward Fest. So the thank you goes out to 11.11.11 or 11, uh, Vlirio OS, of course, Mo, NGO Federation, Moustache, uh, the technicians uh, today, the moderators, the speakers who share their insights and their experiences with us, and of course, everyone who worked behind the scenes, uh, thank you very much. And then, last but not least, a very important group of people I uh, should thank, and uh, that, that's you, the audience. Uh, without you guys, there wouldn't be a Forward Fest, then uh, this whole event uh, would be nice, uh, but not as nice as it was today and uh, yesterday, so please uh, give, just, Let's go out with one big round of applause for everyone that I have just thanked right now, and especially for yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Voila, that's it. So uh, I hope you have a nice evening and uh, that you continue this conversation at home, uh, 6 o'clock Belgian food time. So uh, <laughs> enjoy. Enjoy.